Due to the pandemic, I've spent a lot of time inside this year. With all this time stuck indoors, I got into music. I've listened to about 60 albums from 2020, and I thought it would be fun to compile a list of my top 10 favorites of this year, plus some honorable mentions. American Head is the most recent album by The Flaming Lips. They're responsible for one of my favorite albums of all time, Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robux. While it isn't of the same caliber, it took a second for me. The sound of this record is extremely calming and almost dreamlike at times, and it's the most personal album they've ever released. While not as great as its predecessors, the slower it still stacks up as one of the year's best albums. While it strays away from the psychedelic sound of Lonerism, it uses the electronic sound of Currents and takes it a bit further. The Slow Rush is the only album on the list to release before quarantine, and it was pretty important to me during the beginning of the year. Songs like One More Year and On Track pushed me to do more of the time than I have, and helped me get through the beginning of the pandemic. Song Machine is easily the best thing Gorillaz has released in the last decade, using the same concept as their 2017 album Humans, will be much more refined and enjoyable. There is a good balance between the featured guests and 2D, and the track list is cut up significantly. Although the album isn't cohesive, as it's just a collection of singles released throughout the year, this works in its favor. Compared to past Gorillaz albums, the focus isn't on a storyline, but the variety of the features and how they mesh with the Gorillaz production style. Although I hadn't heard of Gene Dawson before this year, he definitely left an impact on me with Pixel Beth. With its mix of genres and fresh indie sound, it made for one of the most enjoyable listens of this year. Many of the guitar segments on this album are almost hypnotizing at times, and Gene Dawson brings great energy to each track. I'd also recommend his 2019 album, Bad Sports. I'm gonna be honest and say that from here to third place, it's basically a tie. All these albums are great, this was just the order they happen to fall in. Peaceful as Hell features extremely distorted instrumentals and very abrasive lyrics. I know that sounds intolerable, but it's executed very well on this record. It may be difficult to get into at first, but gets better each time on repeated listens. While I don't think I would have found this album if it weren't for Fantano's review, I'm glad that I did. Little Dominique's Nosebleed is a very surreal listen, with obscure 70s samples and skits that randomly appear during songs. It's a concept album that takes you through the life of the Koreatown oddity, with songs like the title track, Kimchi, and Weed in LA, which is one of my favorite songs of this year. Song for Our Daughter is a short but sweet collection of 10 touching folk songs. At only 37 minutes in length, it's incredibly re-listenable. Compared to many of the other albums on this list, Song for Our Daughter is very stripped down, featuring strings, guitars, and vocals, which results in a very intimate listen. I really don't think they could have picked a more fitting album title. Releasing about a month into the COVID-19 pandemic, the new Abnormal was exactly what I needed at the time. I had the album on loop for practically two months straight, and I'm still not tired of it. With extremely catchy songs with many great moments, the band delivers their best material in nearly two decades. This is easily one of the best records of this year. While this isn't an album, it's my list, and I can put whatever I want on it. I've never heard anything like Friggin' Heights, The Wild, Creator Speak 2 before. At a concise 25 minutes long, Slauson Malone delivers with one of the prettiest, most creative projects I've ever heard. The EP goes through concepts of regret and coping with the past, which can be seen in the cover art. Slauson Malone's last album, A Quiet Farewell, features the same artwork seemingly etched in the wood. 
On Crater's Peak 2, that same design appears to be tattooed into someone's skin. This combined with the German origins of the EP title, which is related to the Holocaust, creates a very powerful message. Before I say what my album of the year was, here's some honorable mentions that barely missed the list. This probably would have made the list if it had released a bit earlier in the year, but as it stands, it's still the best thing Kid Cudi has released in a decade, besides Kid See Ghosts. Mac Miller's posthumous release Circles is a great send-off to his musical career. I wasn't aware of him until after his passing, and I wish he would have had more time to continue developing a sound, especially since this is his best album. Yeah, Releasing 8 years after their last project, Miles is a great jazz rap album. It probably would have made the list if it was a bit shorter. Unless you're Swans or The Caretaker, 95 minutes is too long for any album, especially a rap album in my opinion. That being said, I do think that all the songs here are good, it just could have been shortened a bit. You're probably surprised it's on here, I am too. It's not a Wake My Lover because of the internet, but it's still a quality album. While it has great moments, I think it can be a bit bogged down at times due to the lengthy songs and a lack of cohesion with songs like 32.22. I'm not exactly sure what Gambino was trying to do with his album, but he definitely did deliver something. Whatever that something may be. This was really close to making the list, featuring great remixes of old songs by Injury Reserve and Black Dresses, who also happens to be on the list. Unfortunately, for as many highs as it has, the album has some pretty big low points as well, like the Stupid Horse remix and the 99 Jakes remix. I still think that the good remixes outweigh the bad ones, but that's why I couldn't make the list. A friend showed me Dog while I was working on the script for this video, and this very quickly grew on me. Featuring really catchy songs like Land and Puppy, this album could have easily made the list given more time to settle in for me. As it stands, it's still a very fun and enjoyable listen. And with that, let's get to my number one spot. I knew this was my album of the year after the second song. As the follow-up to their 2019 album There Existed an Addiction of Blood, Visions had quite a bit to live up to. Somehow, it managed to not only live up to expectations, but exceed their previous work. Visions of Bodies Being Burned is Clipping's best album to date, perfecting their sound in my opinion. I wouldn't normally consider David Diggs intimidating, Robert Ducky, I'm awfully fond of you. But the horrorcore production manages to make it menacing with songs like Something Underneath and Make Them Dead. David's rapping is on point and matches with the minimal yet still complex instrumentals very well. The album's use for repetition also helps to hammer in concepts when not getting repetitive. All in all, it's an amazing album, and if you had to listen to one on this list, it needs to be this one. So yeah, that's my list. If you think I missed an album, or you just want to say what your favorites from this year were, uh, you can do that in the comments down below, I'd love to hear it. And here's to a good 2021.